Well, hi there, and welcome once again to In Search of Christianity, brought to you by Bible Talk. And as always, the three of us, maybe you know us by now, Mark, Alice, and myself, want to greet you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and welcome you to our ongoing Bible study now in the second letter of Timothy. This is actually our 10th uh, session in this, in this particular study. All of our studies are available on the website, www.bibletalk.com, and these will remain up to, uh, hopefully, until the Lord comes back, mm, nice. which hopefully will not be terribly long. <laughs> That's just me. Okay. So we're continuing on, and we're in the uh, second chapter in the 15th verses, where we left. We actually <clears throat> had gotten started at, at the end of the last week, but didn't really get a chance to get into it at all, so we're going to go back and recap that and go through that verse, 2 Timothy 2.15, which we will do after Mark asks for God's blessing on our time together. Yes, Lord. Oh, Lord, we just thank you for the ability for us to go into your word and to learn from, learn from it and just guide us today and give us what we need to see just for the moment to spread your word. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Okay. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15. And as I've mentioned a number of times, I'm reading from the New American Standard, which is one of the literal type translations, one of the few uh, in use today. Be diligent to present yourself approved to God as a workman who does not need to be ashamed, accurately handling the word of truth. Now, I said I'm using a New American Standard, but I don't particularly like that translation here in this verse. Mm -hmm. The King James says, study to show yourself, uh, thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Be diligent. Okay. Um, I, I, I talked about this. Just like, you, may, you may want to go back because that other, last week's Bible study is still available and will be, just to catch the end of that, uh, where we had gone over, because I don't want to recover a, a number of the things I talked about, but just the idea, study has the meaning of, and we may not have this in our common culture mm -hmm. today, not but it today, means to no. be diligent, to go in, to desire to learn something, mm -hmm. to study, right? You work at it. To work at it. Mm -hmm. you, you've got to be diligent. You know, the Word of God says, and, and Solomon, in his wisdom, in Ecclesiastes uh, 9 10, said, Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all your might. We're supposed to put all of our effort into this, mm -hmm. right? Because we're told, whatever you do, do your work heartily as for the Lord rather than for men. That's what Paul wrote to the church of Colossians, Colossians 3.23. If you're doing it as for the Lord, as unto the Lord, you better be doing it with all of your being, right? Why? Because we're to give 100%. Absolutely. Yep. Hear, O Israel. This is the foremost man. Hear, O Israel. The Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with, you, with your, all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. Deuteronomy 6, verses 4 and 5. All, all, all. That's 100%. That's 100%. You know, it always troubled me. Yeah. <laughs> I, I don't watch much athletics at all anymore. I don't, virtually none. But there was a time when I was very much into that. Mm -hmm. You know, and you'd see some guy run and and you hear the announcer talk, boy, he gave 110%. No, he oh. didn't. You don't, no, he have. Didn't. you don't have 110%. You only have 100%. That's right. All right? The thing is, <clears throat> when they were using those expressions, you know what that demonstrates? That on average, nobody is. So it's exceptional when somebody gives 100%, okay? Most of the other players are giving less than all. We as Christians, are we giving all? Or just as much as convenient, much as doesn't take us to that place where it's really troubled, you know? We have to be concerned or, or studying to show ourselves approved unto God. You know, Paul wrote to the church in Rome and said, 
So then each one of us will give an account of himself to God. Romans 14, 12. We are going to stand before the Lord. We're going to give account for the things that we've done. And we can't fool him because he searches our heart and he knows whether we're giving 100% or not. You might want to write that down. You can't fool, fool God. God. No, you cannot. Because that's the truth. <clears throat> All right? Now, now, there is a reward, okay? Because it says in Revelations twenty two twelve, Behold, I am coming quickly, and my reward is with me, to render to every man according to what he's done. So the question is, are you doing it for the reward? Because there is yet a better way. We should be seeking the approval of God because of love. That's it. That's what it's about, right? That's why we're supposed to be doing it, because of our love for him. That's why we're doing it. Not not for the reward. Yes, there's a reward. But I pray you're not doing it for the reward. Yeah. But you're doing it out of love. He said, if you love me, keep my commandments. He didn't say, well, you'll, you'll get rewards. You know what I mean? It has to be about love. Because that's what Christianity is all about. It's about love. How can you forget what Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 13, that great treatise on love? If I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but do not have love, I become a noisy gong and a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and know all the mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have faith so as to remove mountains, but do not have love, I'm nothing. And if I give all my possessions to feed the poor, and I surrender my body to be burned, but do not have love, it profits me nothing. And then he goes on a few verses later and says, but now faith, hope, love, abide these three. But the greatest of these is love. You do things because you love somebody, right? And the reward is is the reaction. The reward, is, yeah. The reward is the rea yeah. The reward is because you desire to please them. Right, everyone. exactly. It just brought to mind when when I was a little chilling, as you used to yeah, say. Chilling, yeah. <laughs> I we had to iron, which I hated to do, but my job I had to iron my father's shirts, and I loved doing that because of when he, when he'd come home, look in his closet and see all his iron shirts. His reaction was just to die for. I mean, yeah, that's great. So yeah, it is. Yeah. You know, we, we've started and run a couple of schools, Christian schools. And we found really, I mean, that's, that's what truly motivates children in school was the, the, the love of the teachers back and forth or the teachers for them <clears throat> Because that the, gained the response they wanted. They wanted to please the teachers. Right, right. You know, it says, "As a man sows, so shall he reap." When you put out the love, that's that love you'll get in return. Right. And we don't. You don't want to be ashamed, all right. But if you if you are doing it as unto the Lord, you'll never have to be ashamed. But you know, when I when I was praying this today, something came to my mind, and you'll probably recognize this right away. If you know the account of Oscar Schindler, mm. you may have seen the movie Schindler's List about this man in Germany right. who saved so many Jewish people. Okay. And at the end, he was literally buying them. He was paying off Germans to get yes. these people transferred into his factory. And he was doing that to save their lives. Right. Right. And one of the closing scenes in the movie is after the war is over, and the, the Nazis have been defeated, and these people are being released from the uh, death camps. But it's, now it's becoming totally apparent how horrible the death camps were. And he said, if I could have only saved one more. And he, say, he, he says, if I sold my ring, maybe I could have saved. And he's right? weeping. And he's yeah. literally yeah. weeping. But you want to know something? When he stands before God, he'll never have to be ashamed. Mm. Never have to be ashamed. Mm -hmm. Do you remember what the other guy said that was with him? He said, that's enough. You did, did enough. Well, it's, it's good to get the approval of men, but I'm telling you what. Your goal needs to be the approval of God because there is nothing greater than that. And we need to rightly divide the word of truth, okay? That's this handling accurately. Well, that's, that's a kind of a vague statement. You divide the word of truth because when you're sharing the word, you're, are you sharing the, the whole word from from Genesis 1 to Revelation 22? No, you're not. But you don't have time. 
We could, that's that's not practical. It's not okay. Right, right. So what you're doing is you are dividing. You're taking something out of it that you hopefully you're being led by the spirit because it's appropriate for the situation. That's rightly dividing because even though God's word is settled in heaven, God's word is better than silver and gold. God's word is sweeter to the taste than uh, than honey. Right. God's word is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. Those are all from Psalm 119. But even though that's true, it can still be wrongly divided. Mm, absolutely. And believe me, there are many, many people out there wrongly dividing the word of, of truth yes. for their own purpose. You know, Scripture clearly says three times in the Psalms, there is no God. I yes. mean, the, word, the, the Scriptures say there is no God. Mm -hmm. That's wrongly divided. Well, yeah, because it, re it requires that you're wrongly divide the word of God. Because in one place in Psalm 10, 4, it says, The wicked in the haughtiness of his countenance does not seek him. All his thoughts are, there is no God. The wicked say there's no God. And then it says twice, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. Right. They're corrupt. They've committed abominable deeds. Mm. So if I take it out of context then I can tell you and I can tell you that the word of God actually does State. say that there is no God, but that's wrongly divided. Right. Okay. Think about that because I'm going to tell you something. There are, you know, it says test the prophets. Many false prophets, many false spirits have gone out there. Test the spirits. Many false prophets mm -hmm. have gone abroad. That's in, in the letter, first letter of John. That's a truth. And what so many of these guys are doing is they are wrongly dividing the word, taking out what they want, using it, mis misusing it, abusing it mm -hmm. to achieve their own purposes, mm -hmm. right? Satan can use scripture. He has. Uh, yeah. Hasn't he? Yeah, he did with Jesus. He, he used scripture against the Lord, mm -hmm. who is the word of God. Mm -hmm. it, says, it says in Matthew 4, I'm going to read verses 5 and 6, he says, then the devil took him into the holy city and had him stand on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. He's quoting scripture. Yes, he is. However, he did leave out, and that's from all from Psalm 91. He did leave out where it says that he will do this to guard you in all your ways. Mm -hmm. The word guarding Jesus and all of his ways caused him to say to Satan, it is also written, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. He used, he comes right back and at once he is rebuking the devil for attempting to get him to tempt his father and for the devil himself trying to tempt the Lord his God. Because I'm going to tell you something. Jesus Christ is indeed the Lord and God of Holy. Satan. Mm -hmm. He'll find that out. Yes. Just remember something. A half a truth can be a whole lie. Right. That's why it's so important to rightly divide the word. Because in every lie, there is a... a Satan has part no of, creative power. Part of truth. He can't create. He can't bring something into existence out of nothing like God, mm -hmm. God did. Right? So what, he only has the power to pervert something right. to corrupt something so every lie is a corruption of a the truth, truth. Right. okay bear that in mind because and, and the other thing is remember he was more subtle than any other beast of the field is the first thing that it says in the bible in genesis about rebel about uh, satan mm -hmm. so be on your guard be on your guard okay let me just take a second and just some considerations for your Bible studies, your own Bible studies. Not everything in the Word, not everything in Scripture is written to you. Right. Thank God. Mm -hmm. Thank God. Yes. Jesus said, I never knew you. Depart from me. He said that. Yes, he did. Is that to you? No. Pray that it may never be. Jesus, yeah. Because what it is, that's taken out of context. It's wrongly divided. Mm -hmm. Jesus said, many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name cast out demons and in your name perform many miracles? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Matthew 7, 22 and 23. 
If you are not practicing lawlessness, he won't say that. that that's not a word spoken to yeah. you. It's spoken to them. Who's the them? Those who are practicing lawlessness. Mm -hmm. You have to determine who something is written to in Scripture. Right. Okay? I, I'll give you one that I find abused constantly, it seems. Mm -hmm. Okay? You ever hear these words? Mm -hmm. Beloved, I pray that in all respects you may prosper and be in good health just as your soul prospers. 3 John 1, 2. You hear that? I mean, that's a verse that's so often heard, especially from the mouths of so-called prosperity preachers, yes. right? Yes. But it's one that was written by John to a specific person. Mm -hmm. I read verse 2 in, in that third John, right? Mm -hmm. In the first chapter, it's the first verse says, The elder to the beloved Gaius, whom I love in truth. That was John speaking specifically to Gaius. Yes. Right. Now, that doesn't mean that he's necessarily going to be praying that for you. Okay? Gaius was a man known throughout the church for his generosity and support of the work of, of the gospel, right? Right. Now, think about that and think about this. Every, not everything is written to you, but it's clear that everything in Scripture is written for you. Because Paul wrote to the Romans and said, for whatever was written in earlier times, everything, right? Whatever was written in earlier times was written for our instruction. Mm -hmm. So that through perseverance and the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. Romans 15, 4. It's there for instruction. One of the things that you should learn from that instruction to Gaius is that if you have that same heart, if you are a person that God is using to support the church that way, and he is equipping you for what he has called you to, so he's supplying that. He's, you know what? If you have that thing, he's going to have people. So he's going to have somebody praying Thank for you, you. Amen. to prosper and be in health. That's right. But if you're not doing that, why? Why would he pray it? Mm -hmm. Because whatever you prosper in, it's just going to stay with you. It's going to stick with you. It doesn't flow. So, like I said, if you have a heart like Gaius. It's likely that the Lord will have somebody praying for you to have more to give, mm -hmm. not more to have. Right. And there's a big difference. Yes. Okay? Because most of those prosperity preachers, what they're saying is God wants you to have more. And what he was saying to Gaius, because he well, he knew Gaius, he wanted Gaius to have more in order to give more. Right? Mm -hmm. Not everything is written to you. I, here's one I, I think... The Lord showed me I use a lot, okay? An example is found in Peter's opening, his greeting in his letter. Mm -hmm. It says, Simon Peter, a bondservant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have received a faith of the same kind as ours by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Second Peter 1.1. 1, 1. Mm -hmm. The King James translates, he said, to those who have a like precious faith. But either way, you should understand that if you don't have the same kind of faith as Peter, that letter is not addressed to you. So get out your, your black magic marker highlighter and go highlight the whole, because it's not for you. If you don't have the same kind of faith as Peter did. A Peter kind of faith. A Peter kind of faith. Walking on the water. Raising, raising up the daughter and rejoicing when you're water kind of faith. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, let's now zip along to the next verse. Actually, I'm going to read the next two verses. Okay. Verses 16 and 17. It says, But avoid worldly and empty chatter, for it will lead to further ungodliness, and their talk will spread like gangrene. Among them are Hymenaeus and Philetus. Worldly and empty chatter. The King James says vain babbling, right? Mm. Profane and ba vain babbling. Profane does not mean cursing. Yeah. I mean, that's the, way, the only way you ever hear that word used, and you don't hear it much anymore yeah. because it doesn't well, seem like there's anybody, any restriction against profanity, right? right? But profanity doesn't mean cursing. It comes from the Latin profanus meaning outside the temple. Okay? Get that? Mm -hmm. Profanity comes from the word for being outside the temple, which, by the way, is the opposite of the Latin word phanum, 
the Latin word for temple, the root of the word fanatic, somebody inside the temple. Profane is just something, un, not. it's not even that it's ungodly, it's not the cursing, it's just ungodly. Right. It doesn't have any godly content. It has no godly purpose, no godly content. Well, if you're outside the temple, you're in the world. Exactly. Well, that's what he said, avoid the worldly mm -hmm. chatter, right? Mm -hmm. Remember that just earlier in this chapter, Paul had instructed Timothy, telling him that no soldier in active service entangles himself in the affairs of everyday life. Mm -hmm. Talking about the profane. The things outside the temple. It really is very, very logical. Stop and think about this, okay? Mm -hmm. And think about, remember, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Right. James wrote in his letter that the tongue is like the bridle, the bit in a horse's mouth that directs the path that the horse takes. Right. It's like the rudder on a great ship that steers where it's going to go. Your tongue is like that. It steers. Where are you going to go? Where are you going to go? What direction are you going to take? Are you going to Are you going to go in a godly path? Because if, you're, if, you, if your mouth is filled with worldly chatter, you know what? You, you're going to be going into worldly waters. Right. Not living waters. Okay? Mm -hmm. Worldly conversation will steer a life towards worldliness. Does that not make sense? Yes. And it is empty of any value. Right. Vanity. That's what vanity means. It's empty. It has no nothing, no substance. Yeah. That's hardly the desired effect for a tongue of the righteous that is choice silver, as it says in Proverbs 10, 20. And as Solomon had just said prior to that verse, the mouth of the righteous is a fountain of life. Yes. Proverbs 10, 11. <clears throat> so rather than pouring out life-giving words... It will lead to further ungodliness. Isn't that what the verse says? Yes. You know, Isaiah, 750 years before the birth of Christ, said this. Woe to the rebellious children, mm -hmm. declares the Lord, who execute a plan but not mine, and make an alliance but not of my spirit, in order to add sin to sin. It'll lead to further ungodliness. If you're, if you're doing that in ungodliness, You'll add sin to sin. Right. You'll just grow in it, right? Sin not dealt with will always grow. And the Lord will not tolerate anything being stagnant. I mean, you're either going for, let's say, he, lay, lay the scenes. He said, I wish you were hot or cold. Right, right. Not lukewarm. God doesn't want lukewarm. God doesn't want stagnant. But we are designed to grow and to multiply while death unattended will spread. Goes on in that verse we're looking at and it says, and their talk will spread like gangrene. Now it's interesting that the King James says canker. But the fact of the matter is the Greek word that's used here, gangrena, is where the word gangrene comes from in our language. Mm -hmm. It's gangrene. And gangrene is a type of tissue death caused by a lack of blood, blood supply. Right. Okay? Mm -hmm. You right? Yeah. That's what causes gangrene. Now, I have to tell you, I, I flew in the U.S. Navy, and while they told me I was going to be able to go to Hawaii, <laughs> I wound up in the outer islands of Newfoundland, of Canada, and in Iceland. Mm -hmm. So, uh, in my Hawaiian shirt, I was well trained in Arctic survival, okay? And one of the big dangers there is gangrene. Because it comes, when your body gets extremely cold, what happens is to the, heart. the body, trying to save your life, mm -hmm. will direct everything, that, that life-giving blood, all around your core, around your heart. Right. So what happens to your extremities is they're not getting that blood supply. And it has to do with the blood supply. Yes, yes. And that's why gangrene usually hits in the fingertips, the toes, the even nose, the tip of your nose. Because, the ears. you know what? Yeah. The body says, well, I can do without those mm. and still live, right? Without the blood, there's no life. That's right. Mm. <laughs> For the life is in the blood. Mm. I wonder who said that. I wonder, yeah. I wonder whose blood. I wonder whose blood. So it has to be, gangrene has to be stopped. Yes. Otherwise it spreads and the death spreads with it. And you know, to the best of my knowledge, once gangrene has set in, 
it's very, very difficult. I mean, you just keep I mean, cutting it's, away it's, the it's body. Basically, basically, the thing you do is you cut it away. Yeah. It can't, it can't be saved. It's yeah. dead. Right. And it, but that death spreads, right? Yes. Yeah. And that's what Paul is saying here. He says their teaching will spread like gangrene. It brings death. The word of God brings life. life. The word of the world. If it's, if it's vain and empty, babbling, chatter, it'll bring death. Mm -hmm. Okay, now the next verse kind of explains that because in, in verse 18 it says, men who have gone astray from the truth, saying that the resurrection has already taken place, and they upset the faith of some. You know, Paul had to write to the assembly in Thessalonica, right, in First and Second Thessalonians, because of just such a, such a situation. And that possibly even had to do with these two guys that he's talking about. Because in uh, yeah, 17, he named who these I'm men. Not afraid to name names, no. okay? That's the shepherd protecting the flock from wolves in sheep's clothing. Right. Think about this back in, in Thessalonians. Second Thessalonians 2, I'm going to read verses 1 to 3. Now we, we request of you, brethren, with regard to the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together with him, that you not be quickly shaken from your composure or be disturbed either by a spirit or a messenger or a letter as if from us, to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. Let no one in any way deceive you, for it will not come unless the apostasy comes first and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction. Okay? Now, remember that in his first letter to Timothy, the subject of this man, Hymenaeus, had arisen mm -hmm. and had been dealt with. But apparently, he was still causing problems and still blaspheming. Okay? Don't you think that there are a lot of people out there today who are teaching and preaching yes. and the, what they're teaching doesn't line up with the rightly divided word of truth? Mm -hmm. That's why we are called to test all things. <laughs> well, it goes back to the word profane. If you're mixing what's inside the temple or inside the word of God and the culture on the outside, it's going to confuse you and a lot of that's huh. going to seep in. It, uh, it'll be corrupted. It'll, yeah, it'll be corrupted. You become a little warm. Um, I've often said, you know, Satan comes to kill. Yes. So what he'll do is try one of his, one of the favorite poisons of ancient times, poisons. One of the favorite ways to kill somebody was with poison. Mm -hmm. And if you're going to give somebody poison, you don't give them something that they don't like. Right. You give them something that they like, but just add a little poison to it. Right. You don't give them a cup of poison. Yeah. You give them a cup of what they like you and mix. add, a, but you add, you mix in a little poison. That's what Satan is doing. He's trying to take, he's trying to take the word of God. He's trying to take that and add in a little, a little lie oh, here and there, because that'll kill you. Yeah. All right. The word of God is pure, and it has to remain pure. Okay. Yes. So you have to be on guard. Test the spirits. Many false prophets have mm -hmm. gone away. You've got to do that. Yes. And you know what? We're going to talk about that more when we come back again, again. next week. Hallelujah. Time flies. Even so, come Lord Jesus. And Father, we thank you for this time. We thank you for the time that we have together in your word. Lord, speak it to us. Help us to remember to speak it to you, to converse with you about these things. And help us to remember to test all things and hold fast to that which is good. We praise you and thank you, Lord, that you have sent the Spirit of God into our lives to lead us into all truth. Help us to walk in that truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, till next week, God bless you and goodbye. Thank you.